Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 30th episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfansukanik, also known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube. And I'm Mark J. Maharaj, also known as Question Mark on YouTube. And today, we're speaking with the astonishingly talented cartoonist, animator, and director of Thank You For Not Breeding, Nina Paley. Welcome, Nina Paley. Thank you so much for being our guest today on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Um, So let me start out by asking you just some basic questions about yourself. In your words, who is Nina Paley? Who is Nina Paley? Uh, Well, I am a 52-year-old artist and director and animator and cartoonist and scapegoat who hates everyone. That's my little tagline. Grumpy middle-aged artist who hates everyone. Could you expand on that a little bit more? Why do you, I, oh, I'm curious, why do you hate everyone or is that just like hyperbole? Uh, well, I mean, hyperbole. Uh, uh, Would you consider yourself a misanthrope? Yes. Okay, that's okay, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> but also, uh, also a philanthrope, right? Like, mm. you know, love and hate. Yeah. hand in hand. <laughs> I love humanity and I hate it. Uh, you know, love people and I hate them. But, um, you know, I just, when I, yeah, hate, hate is definitely, and you know, I'm cheerful about it, right? Like, we're much <laughs> too afraid of hate. We really, you know, it's like the shadow that people are, are not able to deal with. It's like, yeah, people, you know, they're annoying and they drive me crazy. It's like, okay, it's not the end of the world, no big deal. This includes people I love. This, yeah. this may go into the next question. Why are you an antinatalist or child-free? Which one do you identify with most? Well, I'm both. Uh, I am uh, child-free and also vehement. And when I started getting into this, I would say the, the first aspect of it you know, I never wanted children since I was a child, and that was a forbidden orientation. I knew very early that I was not supposed to be this way, and I was supposed to find babies cute and act like other people and be attracted to them in some way. So uh, I was like horrified with myself for not being like other people, for not being normal but also just aware that this is how I was and I didn't know any other people like me. Um, so in that, you know, I, that is child free. That's what, you know, a child free kid orientation is. I just never wanted them. Um, but I also was extremely aware of environmental issues from a very early age and despaired for the future and was concerned about extinctions and pollution. And of course I put these things together, you know, population. So uh, you were allowed to talk about environmental issues when I was growing up, but you weren't allowed to talk about, well, no, when I was in the seventies, you were allowed to talk about population and then suddenly you couldn't talk about it anymore. Uh, And I mean, it was, I was on my own. It was just like my own uh, secret thing that I didn't have any attraction to children or having them. And, uh, you know, sort of came out about it. I did comics about it. And I, I think I was more concerned about the environmental aspect than any personal aspect. First, I was young and people said, oh, you'll change your mind. So I guess, you know, it's like, well, maybe I will change my mind. But uh, 
the environmental issues have nothing to do with whether I change my mind. <laughs> um, I don't want to be contributing to this. And I thought, well, if I like do change my mind and really want to have a kid, I guess I would investigate adoption, but I don't want to contribute to human population. So I guess it was the, you know, environmental stuff first, but these things were just hand in hand. And then I didn't discover child free as a, as a word or a community until I discovered alt support child free online. So that would have been, I guess the early, the early aughts for me, the very late nineties. Uh, I discovered vehement and the church of euthanasia before then by mail. And those I always thought of as much more environmental, environmentally organized and that environmentally oriented projects. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, as you know, and as I said to you a little bit ago, you know, we've had both Les Unite uh, of Vehement and Chris Corner of the Church of Euthanasia on as guests on this podcast. And, you know, your name has come up so much in those conversations. Um, you clearly, you know, played such an integral and valuable uh, role and, and were a force behind the development uh, of both due to, you know, your immense artistic contributions. So I, I'm curious, how did you originally find, I know you said by mail, but if you could maybe elaborate on, on that a little bit, how did you originally find and become a part of both Vehement and the Church of Euthanasia, Nina? Well, what happened was I had a weekly alternative comic called Nina's Adventures, and I finally screwed up my courage and did some comics about overpopulation and braced myself for a bunch of hate. And I got some hate, but I also got letters from Less Unite and Chris Corda. <laughs> so uh, they reached out to me and I had no wow. idea, you know, that there were other people doing this. And, you know, the Church of Euthanasia existed by then and so did the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. But of course I wanted to interact with these people because it was like, oh my God, I'm not the only one, you know, this is great. So yeah, we corresponded. Amazing, yeah. No, thank you for that. Um, the term antinatalism has only really been uh, in anything resemb resembling popular use since around 2006. So I'm curious, when was the first time you heard the word antinatalism? Uh, long after I heard the word pronatalism. Pronatalism, I heard from some yes. environmentalists. I think it was maybe Kelpie Wilson. Do you know Kelpie Wilson? I'm not familiar with that name, but yeah, yeah. she she was doing education, also from a really environmentalist perspective. So yeah. I yeah, I heard environmentalists talking about it, and and it, pronatalism was the spin in the media. You know, like the way babies are used to sell things and. Right you know, all these images of happy families and happy parents and adorable children and Kodak moments and all that stuff, uh, which I'd never really thought about. But, you know, once I heard the phrase pronatalist, it's like, oh, yeah, they're, they're pushing this, you know, they're making it seem all fuzzy and romantic. Uh, I guess several years after that, I heard the phrase antinatalism. Um, it was a while. And of course, when I heard antinatalism, I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. If there's pronatalism, there'd be antinatalism. And yes, of course, I guess I'm that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, in discussions about abortion, uh, you know, I couldn't say that I, I didn't have that word <laughs> when in the 90s when people were talking about abortion. I, yeah. I'm not actually pro-abortion. What I wanted to say is like, I'm, I'm, like anti-pregnancy, <laughs> you know, I don't want people to be pregnant. But of course, uh, friends and family and, you know, lots of people really want to be pregnant and have children. And uh, I, yeah, in human society. So, you know, like when friend, I remember when a friend of mine, I guess this was in 2008, he told me his wife was pregnant. And I said, did you want that? And he said, yes. And I was like, okay, well, I'm happy for you. <laughs> um, but, you know, I don't automatically go like, 
you know, oh, that's just fabulous. You know. Right. One thing I've uh, noticed through these multiple interviews is that people have different motivations and definitions for antinatalism. How would you define antinatalism for yourself? Uh, you know, against antinatalism, well, for myself? Yeah, because Chris... Cole, I don't, I mean, I don't really, you know, I don't use, it's not a huge identity issue for me, right? Uh, so I mostly think of antinatalism as an identifier that other people use, right? Like, I don't go out and say, oh, I'm an antinatalist. Yeah. Well, well here's, here's the reason why. Like, so the, the antinatalism of Les Unite and Chris Corda and, say, David Benatar are all different. And so, like for um, Les wants the you know the total human extinction. Chris believes in some, uh, now uh, believes in a type of balance and harmony that we can have to work towards a transhumanist. Uh, type yeah, of I aspect. I heard that thing with Chris, and I was like, <laughs> what has happened to Chris? <laughs> Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> I never yeah. thought I'd hear him say things like this. I mean, maybe he was always like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm much more in the less night camp. I'm, I'm okay. much more vehement. Okay. Like, I, you know, may we live long and die out. Uh, I know we're not going to, and I know the chances of vehement succeeding are slim or none, but... Uh, yeah, I would love it if humans just peacefully exited. <laughs> uh, so I suppose I, but, but that's not what, you don't have to be vehement to be antinatalist. I mean, antinatalist right. just means uh, like against pregnancy and birth. Mm -hmm. So I guess what that means for me is like, um, yeah, it's just, it's not something that I'm happy about uh, the way other people are. So when someone is pregnant or gives birth, I have to think of it in terms of, well, are they happy? I could be happy for them because they're happy, but I'm not happy about it in and of itself. I'm always kind of sad, actually. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. But yeah. from an outsider looking in, at least, it does seem like anti procreation has been, you know, extremely inspiring to you creatively, which is something that I, I hugely identify with you on, as I'm also an antinatalist artist. Um, for you, what was it about the subject of antinatalism that made you want to respond to it creatively? There, it, what, there wasn't a subject that I was responding to creatively, I was okay. responding to life. Uh, there, right. Like I say, there was no. <laughs> there was no movement that I yeah. was aware of. Right. There, you know, I was the only person I, I knew. Um, I started, yeah. though, just out of a sense of despair and loneliness. So that was good. Uh, it was like a cry in the wilderness. And I continued because it, even though I did find some other people, it was so out of the mainstream. And yeah. I wanted to speak the truth as I understood it. You could not talk, people just were not talking about it back then. Yeah. Uh, and I had, I had so much anguish. I was in so much pain. I guess I'm, I've sort of made my peace with it. Like when I was younger, young people want to change the world and they want to save the world. And I did too. Like I could not believe this was happening. I could not believe that with, I mean, back then there weren't even 6 billion humans yet, right? Uh, but there were clearly all these environmental problems, clearly all of these things were caused by us, especially Americans and, you know, Westerners that have this huge environmental impact. And it was agonizing to me and I wept, you know, and I, you know, the the expansion of human territory, the expansion of suburbs, the increase of paving, the you know the news about this species or that species being lost, this habitat or that habitat being lost. Making art about it was a way to 
work through it and you know like when a human cries we're crying to each other <laughs> as a as a species i mean sita sings the blues was a similar thing right i was in anguish because yes. of something else and it was like a cry yeah so my next question is that i want to find out um does your um anti-natalism sect with acquisitions say um uh, the right to die, veganism, or say atheism? Well, environmentalism, obviously. Uh, well, yeah, right to die, yes. Um, the right to die thing, I do think everyone has the right to, to end it if they want. It's not a big issue for me, though. Uh, my father, who I just mentioned, <laughs> died. He was a member of the Hemlock Society. Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it. Uh, yes, I've heard of it. I don't know much about it, it though. I, I think it's for you know older, terminally ill people to have some control over their their deaths, uh, to you know not prolong their suffering, and uh, so he was very concerned about having a horrible death and he did not want a horrible death and uh was in the hemlock society and you know i i very much uh, approve of these things what actually happened was uh he did have a horrible death because it turns out that when people actually get closer to death they cling to life uh, under horrific circumstances that when they're in better shape, they would say are intolerable. So as far as end of life stuff goes, who knows what's going to happen when you're actually there, right? Like this, it really taught me that like, you know, I, I have not died. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know what it's like to die. And uh, it seems pretty common that, uh, people cling to life in a way that is unexpected but maybe you know others don't uh but you know that's not related to my antinatalism at all i don't think uh well what else would be related to my is it related to my atheism no i don't think so uh yeah i mean i it seems to be its own thing. I mean, like there's antinatalists that aren't remotely environmentalists. There are right. environmentalists who aren't remotely antinatalists. I remember when I discovered the child free movement, I initially thought that these were environmentalists like me. And it turned out that no, you know, they love driving cars and they just wanted to, not all of them, but some of them were just like, nope, I don't want kids. It's a lifestyle thing totally a lifestyle thing and initially i was like well that's weird and i don't like that but then i thought about it and i was like i don't care why people don't have kids like if they're not having <laughs> kids because they want to have five cars yeah that's okay because five cars have less impact <laughs> than even one kid <laughs> so good i approve of this lifestyle yeah, I mean, from the from my observation from the child free movement, I have a slight negative bias based on that um, that initial response about um, talking more about lifestyle instead of say the ethical implications of the environment, or uh, or the harms that'll happen to other animals and other humans. Um, so I've never really gotten too deep into that movement. Um, but one aspect of the child free analysis that I do like is. Um, uh, pushing back against gender norms. And uh, particularly when it comes to this type of societal obligation to have children uh, for women. And I was curious if, if, if there's any other type of connections um, like that within the child-free movement. Uh, well, I mean, I'm no representative of the child. Or just your observations I'm being just... in it. Well, I mean, that, that's an interesting subject because of late, I have spent a lot more time with uh, feminists and women and particularly radical feminists. So, 
radical feminism is pretty split. There are radical feminists who are like, woman, the source of life. Now our uteruses are amazing because they bring life into the world. And uh, of course I'm not into that at all. Uh, and then there are fortunately uh, pretty adamant child-free radical feminists as well. And uh, if radical feminists wanted to have another huge fight, we could certainly fight and divide ourselves <laughs> over natalism. Uh, fortunately, you know, we don't, and I don't really need to. What I, what I will say about radical feminists is whether they are pro-natalist or anti-natalist, they're all really aware of how big an issue it is for women. Uh, even the most pro-natalist radical feminists have been respectful of uh, child-free women. Like they seem, they seem more respectful than like liberal feminists. Uh, but the, the fact that you can get pregnant, that you're pressured to be a mother, you know, that you're pressured into this role, that you're a member of the reproductive sex class, which is the radical feminist way of describing it, uh, just has a huge impact on your life, whether you have children or not. So um, I appreciate that about radical feminism. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's hell. Like being a, a young fertile woman who doesn't want to have children, it's, it's hell socially. When it comes to the when uh, the online communities with, with Radfem and uh, the Child Free, did you delve into the online communities with antinatalism? Well, that was like when I was part of Alt Support Child Free, there weren't antinatalist communities, and uh, by the time I uh, by the time there were antinatalist communities, I wasn't really part of that. So no, I mean, I'm not a member of any online antinatalist community or, you know, something that calls itself antinatalist community. I'm a bit wary because uh, some communities, most communities, maybe all communities that ostensibly form around something that I really agree with or care about end up attracting lunatics and becoming tribal. Oh yeah. So yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why even though technically I'm an anarchist, right? I, I believe that no one is fit to boss over anyone else. I am not part of any anarchist communities, even though I'm anti-fascist, <laughs> fascism's bad. Uh, ain't no way I'm gonna be part of Antifa communities. So, uh, you know, antinatalist communities, well, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have, I have had some people wander over to my blog screaming and yelling or, you know, or on Twitter or something, you know, being so angry that, you know, what a disappointment I am as an antinatalist. Oh no, because oh, no. I'm I, sorry to hear that. Oh, no, because, uh, I mean, the big controversy that I'm engaged in is um, uh, I have said online that penises are male and that, you know, biological sex exists regardless of identity and have gotten into a world of trouble with uh, modern trans rights activists, which are really different from trans rights activists from the 90s, that's for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. And people that don't know anything about my own history and just assume that, assume like really bizarre things about me. But um, what I was saying earlier about uh, the fact that you can get pregnant as a woman and that you have these social pressures and also physical risk really shaping your life as a woman, uh, that is a biological fact. That's a biological reality. And uh, as, as supportive as I am of 
men wearing dresses and men wearing makeup and women not wearing dresses and not wearing makeup and you know as, as supportive as i am of people breaking out of gender roles biological sex is is a huge issue and uh gender identity doesn't replace that so um that has gotten me in a world of trouble that has gotten me canceled and Oh, you've been canceled. Um, oh, yes. Um, how, how so, so? And, and what's really funny about it regarding antinatalism is, you know, there have been some nutcase antinatalists who are like furious that I'm not willing to say trans women are women. I mean, trans women can't get pregnant and don't grow up like having to worry about that. Uh, uh, what was my point about this? Uh, Shoot, I was going somewhere <laughs> with this. Um, oh, right, right. So they're, they're like antinatalists who are furious. And then there's other people who, you know, hate me for not saying trans women are women. And the fact that I'm an, anti-natalism, an antinatalist is just proof of what a horrible person I am, right? Like, you know, one group, a local group, discovered I was on the Jerry Springer show with Chris Corda and the Church of Euthanasia. And, you know, this was evidence of what a horrible, like, eugenicist, white supremacist I was. Uh, But in the middle of that show, there's this fantastic moment where Chris Corda says, you know, in his dress and beautiful makeup and wig says, sure, I'm a man. I'm transgender. Transgender's about balance. And that's what we're going to be talking about. It's, It's this fantastic moment. And that's what it used to be, right? It used to be so fun and so transgressive. And it's just turned into this absolutely nutty thing. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's a long way to talk yeah. about communities and why I am wary of anything called a community. In fact, I will substitute the word cult for community sometimes when people talk about communities because uh, oftentimes the behavior is interchangeable. Well, I've never really fit in with any community. Um, so it's really hard to find a particular place that feels comfortable. Um, when you mentioned- I, I, I can relate to that so much and it's yeah. like it's okay you know like like when i was young it was like oh i have to find my tribe i have to find my people and you know a lifetime of watching tribes i'm like yeah i don't need a tribe <laughs> i don't like this tribe stuff it's okay to not have a tribe it's fine to have friends friends from different tribes it's all right yeah you can self-select for your own particular tribe from other tribes um to have a supportive network uh I was curious about the cancel thing that you mentioned. How were you canceled? And uh, did you talk a little bit more about that? Oh my God. Well, I was banned <laughs> from Facebook for a couple times. Uh, oh, no. I, I have, I just have so many screenshots from the abuse on Twitter. Uh, my film got deplatformed at some film festivals. It got banned by the art theater in my own town. Uh, I. It wasn't the. Thank you for bringing it. was the... Uh, it was Seder Masochism, right, right. a movie that is not related to this. <laughs> right. <laughs> but movie. because on Facebook, I shared this, the lyrics to a song by the late Connie Bryson, If a Person Has a Penis, He's a Man. And then I did not apologize for it. I did not, you know, I was offered all of, you know, so graciously offered so many opportunities to recant. And instead of recanting, I (laughs) I said, you know, no, you know, and I'm not gonna use, you know, preferred pronouns either. I use sex-based pronouns. And, uh, you know, I wrote various articles, good articles, one called Gender Colonialism and um, none of it hateful and through the whole time you know maintaining my friendships with various trans friends uh yeah but anyway um they just said i was a white supremacist the, locally uh the people that banned me from the art theater uh, i was a white supremacist and a eugenicist and that i hated trans people i want to kill trans people so to address this and to try to have a discussion about it i arranged a discussion like a community discussion at the local public library which included 
uh, Corinna Cohn, who's a trans woman friend of mine, and uh, Carrie Callahan, who's a detransitioned woman. And instead of participating in this conversation, which was set up for them, they instead said that uh, it was a hate meeting and created like a counter counter event protesting i mean there was like nothing i could do i was just like the witch um they just yeah and it was just like all lies and it's just so strange to read these things about does that yourself. does that continue to happen today sometimes yeah i mean this whole group got distracted uh, when, you know, with the pandemic, and then they had Black Lives Matter. They're mostly white. They're all white, really. Uh, but um, they freaking love Black Lives Matter. Uh, so instead of um, going after me, they, you know, went and vandalized the local police station. And I'm pretty sure they're occupying themselves by saying various people are racist. They like to say Black people are racist. <laughs> they're like, white people? <laughs> That, that believe they're anti-racist and uh, yeah, this is whatever. But, um, you know, given an opportunity, they'll, they'll go after me again. Yeah. When this was happening with the um, uh, getting canceled with the theater and stuff like that, did other groups notice this and did this like um, connect you with more of the gender critical sphere? Yes. Uh, Yes. In fact, a lot of women reached, oh, not just women, women and men, but like local women reached out to me because they would have like read about my uh, plight in the paper about my movie being banned. <laughs> and so I was like a lightning rod locally. So I attracted a lot of hate, but then people also knew who I was. And so it helped community a community <laughs> a cult <laughs> form uh, around me where women could talk to each other. That was nice. Um, yeah, people have, have reached out to me online. A lot of people are really scared. You know, I would get lots of, even people in town uh, would privately say like, oh my God, like I, I can't believe what people are doing to you. But none of them would speak out against what was happening to me publicly. They would just privately say like, oh my God, this is terrible. I, I feel so bad for you. <laughs> Okay. Uh, everybody's scared. I'm, I'm in a university town and oh. uh, university towns are, are particularly bad. And my, you know, the University of Illinois is particularly bad <laughs> in this, in this respect. It's yeah. Scary times. It's just funny. It's like for all of the controversial things that I say and do, it's like, really this? Well, I don't think it's yeah. in any of your movies, is it? Um, what I what I recall from um, that movie, and thank you for not breeding. Like I don't think you've talked about this topic in any of those movies, right? Correct. Okay, so Correct. it was just more about like a, a social media post and the and your blog that people are like, well, don't go see this movie. Yeah. Um, but there was nothing in the movie talking about this particular. Okay. No. Yeah. Although you know, Seder masochism. Have you seen Seder masochism? Uh, yes. Um, I can't remember too much of it, but like the opening sequence is kind of s seared into my brain. It's, uh, it's quite a psychedelic tri trip, That's even though I don't know what, it's very beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. Well, anyway, that, you know, since it, it has the whole goddess thing happening and, and visually depicts the goddess giving birth to the sun and things like that, I suppose. I mean, I, I read one angry review of it by a trans activist complaining that there were no you know be penis goddesses <laughs> in satyr masochism because <laughs> only a turf would make a movie like that right <laughs> wow that's a what a what a mess i'm so, i'm really i mean i'm terribly sorry all that happened to your film i mean that's, yeah. it's, a, it's a it's a brilliant movie i mean i we definitely would like to speak uh a little bit more about it later on uh, for sure i mean it's it's a uh, especially the embroidered parts I, well let me ask that now are they actually did you actually embroider all of those frames individually and then it, it, i could i couldn't quite tell if it was actually embroidery or you know if you you know you it was it was rendered to look that way but i mean just incredible 
Oh, well, thanks. Gross. That was a collaboration with Teo Gray, who okay. is a computer programmer who I think he he's one of the founding creators of Wolfram Mathematica software. Okay. Okay. So Teo stitch coded it. Uh, we used an embroidery machine, but programming for an embroidery machine is an art in itself. So oh, I can only imagine. Really yeah. collaborated on that, and Teo's stitch coding is better than any off-the-shelf embroidery software anywhere. So that's why that looks so good. Incredible. Yeah. Um, you you spoke a little bit about this already, but just to sort of. Uh, touch on a little bit further. I mean, antinatalism has changed significantly from the way that it existed in the 90s when groups like Vehement and the Church of Euthanasia sort of had their at least initial heydays. Um, you know, my initial, my question that I'd written down was, you know, had you been following the development of antinatalism over the years? But I know you said you haven't really in the sense of following groups, or I don't know if you've necessarily read you know, David Benatar, some of the, some of the more, you know, modern seminal works that have come out around it. Um, but, so I guess I'll reframe the question like this. I mean, um, you know, the ways that it's changed, again, we spoke about this a little bit, it's kind of gone away from environmentalism per se to more of a concern about sentience, um, that it's not just the problem mm -hmm. of human beings on the planet, but it's sort of like nature isn't a good design in and of itself. DNA didn't you know isn't a a, a force of of justice it's it's this it's this bad program this unintelligent design mm -hmm. that we're all you know a, animal or human animal kind of wrapped up in so it's really life itself nature itself dna itself that's the problem i'm just curious sort of what you think about that as sort of an evolution of antinatalism over the years well i do remember a few years ago reading about a book that i didn't read that was about whether it's just to make more humans for the sake of those humans themselves, right? Because you're condemning, you know, life is suffering and you're condemning someone to a life of suffering. Uh, it, there seemed to have been some, you know, a lot more philosophical questioning yeah. of reproduction. And uh, I was like, that, that sounds good. <laughs> you know, like, I'm glad people are uh, finding reasons to you know, question this reproductive imperative that they have, whether it's social or they claim it's biological. Uh, but, but, you know, there, it's, it's interesting to think about, I mean, uh, living things do reproduce. Yeah. Like, that's, it's almost the definition of, of living things. And humans are oddities i mean the the idea of that we that we choose to have children and we think about it intellectually is probably unique among animals uh and you know it's controversial among humans i think about catholics who are anti-abortion or just people who are anti-abortion in general and their arguments against abortion which you know, there's, since most pregnancies end in spontaneous miscarriages, uh, people have said like, well, you know, why would they oppose abortion then since God is aborting babies all the time? And I think it's because, well, what they're saying is that it should be up to God, right? That if a pregnancy is terminated, that's God's decision, it's not our decision. That being the case, though, they should really, really oppose any sort of fertility treatment and any surrogacy project uh, and all that stuff. It's like, all right, if you want it to be up to God, then it's up to God. <laughs> uh, but there, it's not really consistent because it, we have pronatalism. Right. And would you, would you apply that... At, um to animals at all though? Like for instance, just in, you know, uh, let's divide it between factory farmed animals and wild animal suffering. I mean, uh, has that influenced your opinion of say, uh, you know, going vegan, like you don't want to contribute to, you know, eating meat demands that you, you do, you know, pay it, buy into the, to the pronatalist thing. I mean, you have right. to create animals in order to consume them. So has it had an influence on, you know, your dietary choices or, or, or uh, animal welfare ethics at all? Um, 
do you have any comments? Well, on the, that? the antinatalism hasn't, but I stopped eating meat when I was seventeen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, out of concern, you know, it's like I'm taking a life when I do this. Uh, I have yeah. had vegan phases in my life. I am not vegan now. I do eat dairy products and occasionally eggs, not very often. Uh, but I'm not. I'm not a vegan. Uh, I, I mean, given that I would like humans to peacefully exit and not be on earth anymore, uh, that kind of takes care of factory farming there. It's not like I want humans to exit and I want factory farming to continue. <laughs> factory farming is really horrific. Uh, I would love to abolish factory farming. I would love it if, you know, there's, there's quite a few people who aren't vegan who are also opposed to factory farming. It would be really nice if uh, everyone who's opposed to it could work together and, and make it gone because uh, that's yeah. bad. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the idea of... Uh, you know, nature and natural systems taking care of these population issues by, you know, animals eating each other or feeding each other. Uh, death is part of life. Have you read anything by Derek Jensen? No, I have not, but I've, it's, it's, it's on my list of, of things to check out, actually. Yes, uh, please go on, sorry. Yeah. yeah, well, just that, you know, life, he, living things are not isolated from each other and you know living creatures live in what he calls communities which he likens to symphonies right like when you hear a symphony you don't have the the brass section attacking the wind section <laughs> you know they play together and uh that's the idea of you know these complex systems i guess this is what ecology is about that, that uh, you know, living things live in habitats together and they eat each other and they feed each other. And uh, yeah, that's, that's an appealing idea, but it doesn't seem, it seems like humans, certainly civilized humans are not part of that world. Like that, that doesn't happen around civilized humans. We're we, uh, we're out of nature in that respect. And yet we're a force of nature, right? Like we, we can't stop ourselves. So I do often wonder, like, how did nature produce us? And I have actually theory about that. Oh, would you, would you like to detail that theory? Yes, it's, sure. it's <laughs> not really a serious, it's a poetic theory. So life does reproduce, that's a fundamental quality of a living thing as it reproduces. So you're familiar with the Gaia theory, right? That all of life on earth can be regarded as a single organism? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So how does Gaia reproduce? Right? If the biosphere is a living thing, how does it reproduce? Have you ever wondered about that? No, I don't. <laughs> Because I'm like, I'm like, wait, wait, if it's a living thing, it needs to reproduce, right? Like, that is a fundamental aspect of living things. So, I think that humans are essentially the sperm cells of Gaia not to work, but to spread bacteria to other planets, microorgan or microbes of some sort. So humans right now are hell bent on colonizing space. I mean, even uh, Chris Corda was talking about that. And, you know, I have this fantastic interview with Chris Corda. It's in that thank you for not breeding clip uh, yeah. where he 
talking and that was 20 years ago or something and like the best part one of the best parts of the movie sorry to interrupt but it's an amazing interview yeah oh yeah it was you know and he was like this is never you know and even the parts of it that i don't agree with it's still an incredible yeah sorry go ahead yeah uh it's like this future is never going to exist right we're burning up the planet in order to colonize space he was so critical of transhumanism back then so uh like i say i was i was a bit perplexed uh but anyway humans yeah we're hell bent it's like a it's like a religion now we are going to colonize space you know anything to go out to space and you know, it, it's not going to work, right? Because of uh, fundamental facts about ecology, like we're, we're yeah. not isolated from the systems that we live in. But we're meat bags carrying lots of bacteria. So we'll go to other planets and other, we only need to go to one and die. And all that bacteria has human bodies as food. And that's mm-hmm. enough to, you know, get eventually after a few million years a biosphere on another planet <laughs> so it's it's gaia's no. reproduction right it's uh it's not it's not going to be humans but but some sort of living thing just has to be hell-bent on you know finding another space rock yeah so and also when a lot of creatures many creatures die when they reproduce that they use all of their resources to do that. So if Gaia is dying, we can just think of this as Gaia's reproductive phase. Uh, but even those that don't die, they, they can still consume a lot of resources in reproduction. So perhaps that's all that's happening is we're just chewing up the planet in order to shoot bacteria into space. Hey everyone, I just want to take a quick second out of your regular Exploring Antinatalist uh, podcast episode. I'm Lawrence, I'm one of uh, two hosts, Amanda is the other host of the new Antinatal News podcast. Uh, This is a new podcast run by Annie, Antinatalism International. It's a podcast that's going to be monthly, released on the first day of every month. It's going to be covering the big topics both in and out of the antinatalist community. It's available on the Annie YouTube channel, SoundCloud, Apple podcasts spotify google podcasts and it will be coming to more platforms soon as well if you want to let us know about any upcoming news stories relevant to antinatalism you can email them to us at antinatalnews at gmail.com and if you want to keep up to date with daily updates for antenatal news then head over to twitter and follow the at antenatal news account sorry again for the interruption i hope you enjoy the rest of the episode So to go back to the conversation about anarchism, um, does your view on anarchism influence your views on the, um, what was it, the, the free culture movement? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm an anarchist at heart, right? Like, I just don't think people should be bossing each other around. I don't think I should have control over you and I don't think you should have control over me. And I, you know, no one is fit to boss over anyone else. So uh, the idea that the culture in your head is controlled by somebody else, by some other authority other than you, that, you know, I'm not down with that. So free, you know, free culture is just like you put something in the world and now it belongs to the world. And once it enters somebody else's head, it's in their head and you don't get to go into somebody else's head unless they invite you in. So um, it, would re- it would reject copyright, right? Yeah, I reject copyright. Okay. Was there any other aspects to the free culture movement for someone who doesn't know what it is? Oh, sure. I mean, there's plenty of the free culture, plenty of people in the free culture movement who aren't copyright abolitionists like me. I mean, just, you know, just like I'm, don't take me as a representative of any, (laughs) any movement, right? I'm, I'm just me. A lot of people in the free culture movement, they're not really about what I would call genuinely free culture, but they just want some sort of uh, easing of restrictions. They're okay with some restrictions. So a lot of them 
support less restrictive licenses. I'm opposed to licenses on principle. It's like, no, you don't need a license to engage in culture. There should be no licenses at all. There should be no copyright at all. Culture isn't property. But others, you know, the people that coined the term the free culture, you know, they're, they're not like me. They are okay with some restrictions. I mean, really, I, I, I like the, I, you know, this phrase anarchy now. Uh, okay. Anarchy now is like, okay, you want anarchy? What can you do, right? And authority, there's, there's two sides of authority. There's, you know, the, the top and the bottom, <laughs> right? And if you're on the bottom, what can you do? Like, are you enabling the top? Well, maybe stop doing that. You know, are you obeying a terrible law? Maybe stop doing that. This, of course, is incredibly reckless and uh, dangerous. And uh, I only advocate this for, for things that I've thought about deeply and for a very long time. I mean, I, especially as I get older, I understand much better why we have laws, why we have social contracts and stuff and uh, violating these things willy-nilly is a really bad idea but regarding copyright I have thought about it really deeply really a lot I've been in the copyright industries most of my life uh, I am confident about my position I did not come to it easily and nothing you know since i have come to this position nothing has changed my take on it it was not easy to get here okay thank you yeah and actually i think about things where i you know i've i've changed my mind about a lot of things in my life as we all do uh but something that i've never changed my mind about is you know my antinatalism yeah. right it's like when i you know i was like this when i was really young and i'm still like this now and it's never changed people said you'll change your mind it never <laughs> happened and if anything i my, my gratitude for never having children has just only increased everyone was like oh when you're old you'll really feel bad that you didn't have children it's like uh-uh i am so glad i never had children What, uh, what benefits or things are you grateful for, for being child-free? What are some of the positives? Oh boy. Well, <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, first, uh, knowing that I have not contributed to the further degradation and extinctions. Second, knowing that I have not condemned somebody to live in this world, which I would be so worried for, younger people right now. Uh, yeah, those two things. I mean, I am worried for younger people. Uh, yeah. But yeah. I'm so glad I didn't do that just to gratify myself. Nina, do you still consider yourself a, a part of Vehement and the Church of, of Euthanasia? And if not, why? Yeah, I, I am. I mean, not super active. They're not super active either. Uh, Chris made me a, what did he say? Did I get to be a cardinal because of my performance on the Jerry Springer show? Oh, cool. I, I was elevated in the church for that. That was nice. Um, and, but more than the Church of Euthanasia, vehement, I just feel like less expressed everything so well and that that writing is pretty timeless. And uh, I pretty much agree with uh, vehement altogether. Church of Euthanasia, it's a little too da-da to even agree or, or disagree with. <laughs> uh -huh. It's a performance art project mostly. Um, so yeah, I would say I'm, I'm vehement, that hasn't changed. And, but you know, vehement is a, is a movement, it's not an organization. Right, right. 
Well, let me ask you just a little, little bit about vehement. Um, so I, you know, I have, I have huge respect for last night and, and uh, I appreciate so much of, of, you know, what he has built. And, uh, and there's, there's quite a lot about vehement that I, I, I really, really, really like. Um, but the, there's a core disagreement between sort of what I believe and what vehement believes in that um, I, I think all life should go extinct. I think it's all, it's all, all life suffers. And it's all, um, it's all not for any good reason whatsoever um, that sentience is sort of the biggest problem in the world. I mean, if it suffers, there's no, there's no reason to keep this reproductive um, thing going indefinitely. There's no reason to keep the planet spinning. Uh, there's no, so, I mean, you know, I, I think that when, you know, if you, if we tell people to stop procreating enough, we do get to this point, we reach sort of the, a crossroads where, um, you know, we're going to leave the, the animals behind. And that's the part of vehement that I find, like, just uh, sort of an abomination, sort of to my own sensibilities, that we have a responsibility to find some way of also, um, unfortunately, having to speak for them and sort of evacuating them from this never ending cycle because all they're really going to meet eventually is some sort of natural extinction, which is going to be horrible. Why would we, why would we look at that amount of suffering that they will eventually come to? Um, not only that eventuality, but the, you know, the endless cycle of birth and death, the endless generations working up to that point, ripping each other to pieces for no good reason. Human beings are awful, <laughs> but they're also the only ones who may be able to devise some sort of way to get them out of dodge, so to speak, so that none of that has to keep happening. We're sort of the only thing on this planet that could, in my opinion, do the right thing um, and cause some form of sentient extinction. So what do you think about that? Wow. <laughs> That's a new one. Uh... My initial thinking on it is that I don't think animals suffer the same way humans suffer. They don't have language. Uh, I think that um, I like life, but really I just don't think it is for humans to decide about other species. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I think we we're up in other humans business more than we should be. And we're up in other species business up more than we should be. And I don't think we can make these value judgments about other life. Although certainly we are responsible for domestic animals we're certainly i mean like uh farm animals and rats and pigeons you know pests all these there, there are species that are absolutely connected with humans so we have a certain responsibility for them but in terms of other life on earth no i don't think we can do that yeah, like, I mean, your, your judgment about like, oh, man, this is, they're all suffering, and that's bad, and so we should eliminate it. I'm like, well, uh, I think, I think humans have a tendency to make judgments based on limited information and then try to fix things. And that's bad. <laughs> it's like when we try to fix things, that's real bad. Well, so, we certainly, so, yeah, we certainly put our foot in things and make them worse on a on a, on a lot of <laughs> a lot of situations, yeah. almost all situations, I suppose. Uh, and I appreciate your answer on that. Thank you. So I, so I wouldn't. I just for me, it's like no, I would not try to fix the problem of life. Uh, well, and, and and you know the important thing about the voluntary human extinction movement, the the part that most people overlook, voluntary. Right, mm -hmm. so the only people that can that are gonna participate in the human extinction part are volunteers. Sure, of course. Yeah. One person doesn't, which is why it's never gonna work, and why it's mostly a, a you know, it, it's. Uh, 
paradoxical and you know mostly a way it's like a cry it's like an artistic cry in the wilderness for people like me and Les to find each other uh yeah it's I don't, I, I am against making decisions for others, even regarding uh, like human reproduction. I mean, one of the ironies of me being gender critical in these days is I am opposed to transing children because I don't think children can consent to uh you know permanent sterilization and that's saying a lot because i'm an antinatalist right like i don't want people to have children but i want it to be their choice <laughs> you know like i it, this has to be a choice made by adults and so uh as much as i would love it if humans stop reproducing sterilizing children is wrong <laughs> right like they have to be able to consent to it and um you know in my mind not doing anything is also making a decision for them if we go extinct we are such an integral unfortunately part of what what this place is um that if we were just you know, my, my point is that if we're, if we're able to recognize their suffering, and even if it's not to the extent that humans suffer, which is not, not my concern, it's the fact that they can go ouch. <laughs> they, they know what ouch means. They, they, they don't need, to, they don't need mm -hmm. to know huge existential problems. They know, they know, they know, they know suffering. So um, if we can recognize that and then not take that on as some sort of responsibility, that's sort of the same as we're speaking for them no matter what we do. But yeah, no, thank you for your thoughts on that. I really yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, one thing about suffering is it's not that bad. I mean, it's like, it, it sucks, but part of being a grown up is accepting that you suffer. And I, again, I think about my father and the Hemlock Society and, you know, he wanted to avoid all this suffering. And in the end, he chose the suffering. It was, you know, really undignified and horrific. Uh, but that was what he did. And so it's like, do we really understand suffering? I mean, we don't, it's like death is a mystery. Uh, I think at some yeah. point the organism just fights. I think yeah, it might just be a knee, almost a knee-jerk kind of mechanism to being alive. Yeah, I mean, I thought about this myself because when I, you saw Sita Sings the Blues, right? Yes, yes. Right, so after my husband dumped me by email, I was in just absolute agony. Yeah. And in San Francisco, I was like, I just want to die. I want to die so much. I want to die. And I was like, all right, if you want to die, stop breathing. And I did, you know, I like stopped for maybe 60 seconds. <laughs> and then breathed again. And I was like, hmm, okay, my body clearly wants to keep going. And how much of me is this part of me that wants to die? Uh, probably not really that much. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's much more going on in us than just our, our egos and that top layer. And our bodies are not separate from us. They, they are us. The part of us that speaks with language may be alienated from it, but it, it's still, that's still me. So, you know, it's like, I could say it's just, you know, just this biological will to survive. Well, that's me too. I mean, I, I am that. I am an animal. Uh, yeah, so I, I'd love to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about your movie, Thank You for Not Breeding. Still to this day, the closest thing that there is to uh, a documentary about antinatalism. Um, I think even if um, 
modern antinatalists, let's let's call them, agree with nothing said in this film. Uh, it's 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 an incredible portrait of how anti procreate how the anti procreation movement, such as it was, um, existed during that time. It's an amazing portrait of that time. Um, what can you tell me about how this project first came about? Well, I wanted to make little animated bits about the subject because I had a song in my heart and it had to get out and I want people to see them and I thought the way they will see them is if there's a longer piece because for some reason people have more attention for feature length things so I was, was like I'm going to make a documentary and I was in the process of making that documentary when my partner went to India and various things happened that became Sita Sings the Blues and I never finished the documentary. Yeah. But, you know, there's bits of it, which somebody put online, and I'm glad for that, but it's not finished. And I'm never going to finish it. I have many hours of video, lots of interviews that I did, all on digital video tapes, these little tapes, and they're just rotting. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Uh, they should go to someone. Um, I don't even have a way to see digital video tapes anymore. I, uh, but, you know. I I've actually been trying to come up with a rig myself because I have I have so many mini, mini DV tapes and they don't last long unfortunately so mm. that's unfortunate so so I mean that was one of my next questions was you, you don't believe that you'll ever finish it I, I I would I would love to see sort of a you know an addition to it sort of like a you know you're investigating sort of more modern antinatalism but I I can understand that some projects just yeah up that way. I mean the thing with antinatal like I say like there's I feel like there's just nothing I can do. I'd be more interested in it if I thought there was anything I could do regarding uh, humans reproducing. And there's just not. They're gonna do it. Like no matter how smart they are. I remember, did you ever read this book called Maybe Two by Bill McKibben? You no, I have book? not, no. So Bill McKibben, he's this famous liberal environmentalist and he was against himself having children and then he decided he was going to have a child and he wrote this whole book about it and it was an intellectual train wreck and you know he knew he knew all the issues but he just had to have his own kid and it's like what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> They're going to do it, you know, and I'm, and I'm opposed to uh, authoritarian control over population and I don't have the right to boss over anyone else. So I don't have the right to tell people if they're going to do it. So this is going to happen. And I'm just here for the ride. You know, I'm, I'm just a witness. Um, you know, I have, I have immense respect for those that have children and then, you know, realize this thing about the world. And, that, and that's, a, that's a, a very sad circumstance that some people do find themselves in. I know many antinatalist parents. But that, that reverse of that, of going from the other end of the spectrum to the other is just, yeah, very, very strange. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I've tried to understand it. Uh, I think I've made my peace with never understanding it. Uh, I dated somebody with kids at one point, and I was like, I'm going to really, you know, learn what it's like to do this. And I was like, nope, still don't get it. Yeah. Never will. It's okay. Lots of other things I'm never going to understand. So, um, Was Thank You For Not Breeding ever shown at film festivals? Did it ever get any, any live screenings? And if so, what was the response? I mean, what, did, you have, did you experience much, much pushback from the film at all? Well, I never submitted it to film festivals because I never finished it. So right. what's online is just a rough cut. But some of the shorts were in film festivals. The Stork, the Stork yes. got around. It was actually in Sundance. Oh, wow. Okay. Amazing to me, yeah. Yeah, uh, the animated sequences are beautiful. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, there's some, some of those have Chris Corda's music. Oh, do they? I didn't realize that, actually. Okay. okay. Yeah. Do you think you'll uh, pick it up again or put any updates to it? No. No, okay. Yeah, there's one called Furtco that has Chris's music. Okay, okay. Where it's going, buy, consume. 
bye. Oh, okay. Okay. What? Well, that that yeah. makes sense, right? <laughs> That's very much his style. Um, yeah. Well, I, I very much hope that at some point the archival footage can be saved. I mean, it seems it seems a bit of a bit sad for it to to just rot. But but I you know I completely understand. And it, it is. Well, I can give. I I talked to Les. Les for a while was thinking about doing something with it. So Les, if you're out there. If I haven't sent you these tapes yet, I should send them to you. Maybe I did send them to him, but I'm pretty sure they're in storage in our garage somewhere. Okay, okay. Do it, Les, do it. <laughs> Save the footage. Um, um, antinatalism in, in many ways is a, a new subject matter for artists to work with, and it's still a very sort of under-consumed subject for creative people. Um, what do you see, if any, uh, as being the future of antinatalist art, and what would you like to see other artists do with it, if anything? Hmm. Hmm. Has there been like a gallery show or a collection of antinatalist art? Not really. Um, there was an illustrator. I, I have no idea how to pronounce his name, but he did some portraits of antinatalists and that got into a show. Um, I, I know uh, if, if coronavirus hadn't happened, I know Chris during his interview was saying that uh, there was going to be sort of a retrospective of, of his work with the you know, specifically talking about antinatalism as well, or having that, that word attached to it. Um, I've shown some of my antinatalist work in galleries and stuff, but uh, not as much as I would like. But no, not, not, not really. Um, but there is, um, you know, the community as it's forming, um, there is more of an artist's uh, approach, uh, you know, solidifying and taking place. There's something called the Fellowship of Antinatalist Artists, which, you know, every month tries to get people to make work around the subject. Um, so it's been a slow climb towards that, but I, I just personally feel like it has all of this potential. Um, you know, as I've, as I've said many times before, I mean, in this world where everything is, the complaint is everything has been so consumed and done to death. I mean, antinatalism is kind of this subject that that's not necessarily true of. Um, it For hasn't sure. really been consumed, so. Yeah, well, uh, I would love to see an online gallery of antinatalist art. I would, I would love to see that too. Um, so someone should make that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying. Yes, I know, I know. I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, in your opinion, what does the future of the child-free anti-procreation anti and antinatalism look like? Well, I don't know what the present looks like, so it's hard for me to say what the future looks like. I mean, it is cool that more people are into this now. That's good news. Yes. So if that happened, maybe even more could be. And maybe my dream of people voluntarily not reproducing to the point where it actually reduces the population, maybe that could happen. Probably won't, not holding my breath, but possible. I don't know what the end, you know, result is going to be, but I will say, yeah, I mean, in the last 10 years, um, again, the communities that have built up around this have increased in size tremendously, and it is all over the world. I mean, there's a South American Facebook group that has over 100,000 members. There's big, big, big groups in um, Egypt and Lebanon, um, lots and lots of antinatalists in India. So that's been a really fascinating part of, part of, you know, watching that, that, that part of it grow. Um, so who knows, you know. As this is, of course, an anti-natalist podcast, I wanted to keep the questions close to that subject. However, it would be a crime for me not to mention how brilliant your other films are, particularly, uh, and I, I'm so sorry for pronouncing the name of it wrong. Is it a Sedar masochism? Seder. Seder. I'm, I'm sorry. Seder masochism, yeah. uh, which I highly encourage people to go check out. Um, would you mind telling our audience a little bit more about this film and perhaps... Uh, some of the controversies that it faced, although I know you explained uh, a lot of that. Yeah, Seder masochism is about the Passover story. And it came about after these criticisms of Sita Sings the Blues based entirely on my ethnicity. The idea being that uh, a white Christian woman, which they assumed I was, a white Christian woman has no business doing art based on a Hindu epic or an Indian epic, uh, which 
is obnoxious identity politics <laughs> um, and a stupid criticism of something like, you know, who may, I'm a big fan of separating the artist from the art. In fact, I'll go on a tangent about that, separating the artist from the art. You yes, should freaking do. separate the artist from the freaking art. Because like artists, I mean, this whole thing when people become these these salivating fans of artists, that's not good. Like, you know, an artist is not your mom, not your hero. It's just a person that, you know, made a thing and love the thing. You're not gonna love it. The person's not the same as the thing. And the devoted drooling fans are the first to throw rocks at the artist as soon as the artist disappoints them. and just don't go there, right? Like just something is going to disappoint you about that artist. And the whole thing with art when it's really good is the artist is channeling something that's bigger than the artist. So, you know, don't, don't be angry at the messenger, right? They're just messengers. And what you like is the message, not the messenger, right? Don't shoot the messenger. Don't worship the messenger. Just, Forget about the messenger and attend to their work. Yeah. Uh, right. So anyway, the idea was that uh, I was supposed to do something about my own genetic heritage and only that would be okay. So I was like, all right, you want me to do something about, <laughs> about Judaism? And they didn't even know I was Jewish. It's like, all right, I'll do that. Uh, also, some critics of Sita Sings the Blues called my Hindu collaborators self-hating Hindus. And I oh, thought, God. I know that rhetoric. My people came up with that rhetoric. That is bullshit. Uh, but also, I was thinking about my father who was in the process of dying and I knew he came from a religious family and I was just like, yeah, I'll just do something about Passover. And I interviewed him shortly before he died and made a movie about Passover. The problem is that the Passover story is actually a pretty incoherent story. The Haggadah or Haggadahs, uh, they're not written as literature. Uh, my choice to structure the movie around the Haggadah was really a terrible one as far as narrative is concerned. I read the book of Exodus and tons of commentaries on the book of Exodus and the Old Testament and all this stuff, which I'd never really been into, and proceeded with the film without really knowing where it was going. And after I finished all the scenes that were based on Exodus, I was like, okay, what is this movie about? I don't care about Moses. I don't like this Exodus story. Uh, why am I doing this? Like, what is this? And... I eventually took inspiration from the book When God Was a Woman by Merlin Stone, which her thesis was that Exodus was about the end of goddess worship among Hebrews. And to finish the film, I had to resurrect the goddess. I had to come up with images for pre-Abrahamic goddesses or the goddess, the great mother. So then I read about that. I got into the Maria Gimbutas books and Jungian stuff, the book, The Great Mother. And I resurrected a great mother. We don't have any remaining early religion left. So we have to recreate it or reimagine it. And ultimately the film was about, you know, the great mother versus the patriarchy and how the great mother was sent underground. And that's what we have today. She's still around, but she's underground. And you know, it's animation and music. and It's just a thing. You can watch it for free, free culture. Just go to archive.org or go to satermasochism.com and go to the download page. You can find places to download it. 
Yes, absolutely. I, it's, it's also on Vimeo as well. It's a, yeah, it's just an incredible movie. That, that last, I don't want to give it away for those that might check it out, but that last scene, the, the you know, this land is your land, this land is my this land. This land is mine, yeah. Wow, yeah. That's its own short. So I, I animated that first and I okay. released it first. I released that in 2012 as an independent short because I didn't know if I was going to finish the whole movie. So it's like, well, at least I'll have some shorts. And that scene, this land is mine, is the most watched thing I've ever made. Just I was reading about that. Bill, yeah. yeah, amazing. I mean, congratulations on that. Well, I mean, well deserving. Uh, it's a very, very powerful piece. And I mean, you know, you can't, even though it's not explicitly there, I suppose, it's hard for me to watch that and not see. I mean, of course, like, there's so, you know, you can't not watch that as an antinatalist and go, yup. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, I don't know how else to say it. I mean, it's like, yeah, that's that, this will, this will get anybody there or should, you know. So, yeah, no, brilliant. Um, may I ask what you're, what you're working on currently? What's, what's your upcoming projects? Well, uh, a fun thing that I'm doing that sustains me is called $100 Drawings. It's a free okay. culture project. People send me $100 and I make a drawing based on one or two words that they give me. Okay. And if they don't like it too bad, they want any changes, they have to send me $100 again. <laughs> Uh, and that's really pleasurable. I have a string of projects on hold, including one based on the apocalypse, the Christian apocalypse, the book of Revelation. Okay. I should pick that one up again. I just haven't. I think maybe I just need to be away from animation for a while. That yeah. happens. Yeah. Uh, I am putting eyes on shoes because I had a dream. Oh, wow. Where a high heeled shoe had an eye like this on it. I love and, that. Uh, so I have piles of polymer clay and I'm, you know, developing my own eyes. Here are some different ones. It's just, you know, I can oh, spend beautiful. Yeah. days making eyes. Is it super sculpy? Uh, this is. Fimo, there's okay. kind of a shortage. It's kind of hard to get the stuff, so I have to Fimo? Yeah. take what I can get. Like what I really want to be using is called Sculpey Primo because it's more flexible, uh -huh. but yeah. it's really hard to get in colors. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's occupying me all day. And uh, yeah, I've got like little side things going on. I made masks this year. Okay. You know, with the angel of death on them and doing little things and doing little artist things sometimes I feel like I'm not doing anything and then I look back on the year and I'm like wow I did all sorts of things <laughs> <laughs> so many things well, uh, do you think, there's sorry, a music do you think? video I, I did for a European pop singer and that's going to be released on February 14th I cannot wait oh wonderful okay finished it at the end of October and I as a free culture person, I wanted to release it immediately, but she wanted to go through music industry processes. So, sure. Yes, chomping at the bit for that thing to get out. Where, where should people uh, look to find that uh, YouTube. upcoming? YouTube. May I ask the name of the band or, or the music project? Uh, I guess I can say now. Her name if is you can, Gala. Okay. Gala. Her name okay. is Gala, and she wrote some sort of anthemic songs in the 90s pop songs okay one of her songs gets sung at european football games regularly okay. called freed from desire and how that happened i don't know but and she still performs she can just totally you know she has the audience in the palm of her hand when she's on stage i've seen videos of her she's oh wow a, uh but anyway, this song is a stylistic departure for her, and it's a the video is a stylistic departure for me, and I can't wait. It's called Parallel Lines. Okay, I'll so be looking forward to that. That's awesome. February fourteenth, Parallel Lines. Excellent. Do you think you'd uh, come back to the subject of antinatalism in your work? I might, but like I say, I've made my peace with it. Like I generally do work about things I haven't made peace with. Mm. And Sita Sings the Blues, the whole point of me making that movie was to make peace with what happened to me. And it, it took five years to get over that stuff and making Sita Sings the Blues is the way I did it. I will say that once I, and by the way, Sita Sings the Blues is based on a heartbreak of, uh, yeah. you know, 
divorce. Uh, the, the thing, it's like I've made my peace with it, you know? I, I, don't, I don't think I can save the world. I don't think anyone can save the world. I'm just here to watch. So probably not. And the fact that, like, like you're saying, antinatalism is growing, like, without me doing anything. That's fine, right? It has a life of its own. Well, I think, your, I think your contribution to it, though, has meant a lot. Like I said, it's the only, you know, Thank You for Not Reading is still the only documentary that we have on the subject, um, even though it, it, it portraits, it's a portrait of an antinatalism that still exists, but maybe is not like the dominant form. Yeah. I mean, it's still, you know, when people go and search for this topic or they have these ideas in their mind, but don't have a word to attach to it yet. I mean, Thank You for Not Reading is something that people find and find sort of a, a home in, you know, maybe they don't stay there. Maybe they go to another form of antinatalism or whatever, but I mean, it's uh, that movie has definitely had a, a huge impact on people. I mean, I, I hear people bring it up all the time. Hmm. Um, wow. So I, I think it's been, a, I think it's been a, an important contribution. So I you know I, I, for one, thank you for that. So is there an environmentalist strain of antinatalism in modern antinatalist communities? That's a bit hard to say. I mean, my initial, uh, my initial opinion would be to say no. Um, what do you think, Mark? No, right? It's a, it's a pretty definitive no. Um, no, I run into environmentalists all the time. It's hard to categorize antinatalism these days, actually, because, you know, like Chris will say, Chris Corda will say uh, they're an antinatalist but it's a complete departure of what Benatar is saying. And Benatar is different than what Les Unite is saying. So it's like, well, how are we, how are we def that, that's why I asked you, the, the, how do you define antinatalism? Because it's, it's really hard now um, to say what is antinatalism. But when it comes to the anti-procreative um, umbrella, I definitely run into a lot of environmentalists. So I think so. And then also just philosophers or nihilists <laughs> there is a like nihilist a contingent yeah i mean I, yeah it does run the gamut i think i mean there are people that are that are in the movement because they hate children or there's people in the movement that you know are in the movement because they hate suffering or there are people that are in the movement that just want mm -hmm. to do something about human procreation but then there's uh what's called ethelists who are very interested in doing something about sentience and anything that can feel is 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 what need you know is what the problem is um so i think that what antinatalism is 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 always in flux it's always sort of changing it's a, it's a very wide umbrella um and i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't call myself an environmentalist but i i'm not i'm not an antinatalist who thinks that environmentalist concerns are stupid or silly or anything like that i mean i think while we're here we should really pay attention to this stuff. I mean, it's not, you know, um, but I'm not trying to save the planet. I mean, my, my reasons for being an, uh, an antinatalist is not because I have uh, a desire to save the planet. I, I want sentient life to go extinct. I think that's, that's the right way forward. Um, so, but I want it, I want it to happen in a way that isn't going voluntarily, to Voluntarily, right? Voluntarily. Well, I, I don't think that you can do it voluntarily for the animals. I think it's a different story when it comes to the rest of sentient creatures. So how do you do that in the most graceful way possible that causes the least amount of suffering? Well, that is the question. That I think, I think you just, hi, oh, sweetheart. Oh, cute. What a sweetie. Oh, crap. She's not a vegan. <laughs> no, <laughs> she's a little meat eating terrorist, isn't she? Sweetie, she's beautiful. She's so affectionate. Yeah, she's very needy. Here she comes. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, not at all. Not at all. That. So, uh, you know, I think it's a uh, it's a very wide tent. And I think that it's, but it's also, it's also still this very obscure subject. So what will antinatalism look like in five years? What will it look like in 10 years? What version of antinatalism will outdance the rest? <laughs> you know, I think is sort of the question at the moment. And I don't really know what that's, I know what I'd like it to be, but I don't really know what that will look like. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, 
love doing this podcast because it does sort of do a make a create a portrait of all the different ways that this subject is existing in the world right now and i, I find that fascinating yeah 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 cool yeah <laughs> well uh nina thank you well, so much people's reasons are i'm i'm grateful Oh, thank, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, Nina, thank you so much for being our guest today on Exploring Antinatalism. It's really, I've wanted to speak with you for so long, so I really just want to say thanks so much for uh, for coming today and uh, entertaining our questions. Oh, <laughs> so cute. <laughs> I'll leave you two alone. No. <laughs> really sweet. <Yeah. laughs> Yes, this is Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Before we close up, was there anything that you wanted to address or comment on or um, talk about uh, just to add in? Or do you think we covered everything? Oh, we can never cover everything. So much <laughs> remains mysterious. <laughs> well, was there anything that you would like, uh, you know, to be added? Well, if people want to know what I'm up to, they should check ninapaley.com. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. Go check you. it out. Links below, everybody, to all of uh, all of Nina's all of Nina's links. Oh, and also uh, Neenster.org. It's alternative social media. It's part of the Fediverse, which is an alternative to Twitter and Facebook. There's oh, cool. I don't know what that sites, is. But I have my my own server called Neenster.org. Oh. Check it out. Yeah. Make a free account. Could you possibly send me um, a link to that? Actually, I've never I've never heard of that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just one. It's just one Fediverse instance among many, and and I created it just in the hopes that people that I, you know, friends and Facebook people, people that are looking for an alternative, I see. could have like a launching pad there. But it's connected to all these other Fediverse servers. So you, there's there may be an anti-natalist Fediverse server. Now that would be a thing. <laughs> yeah, I have to go check that, that out. Yeah, if it doesn't yes. exist yet. It's better never yeah, to have been, but I'll have to go make that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, have a have an antinatalist Fedverse. I would I would make an account there. I would visit y'all. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> sounds sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right, cool. Anyway, right. it's been a pleasure. Thanks. It's so much. been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Take good care. Bye bye. Please visit Nina Paley on her blog, follow her on Twitter, and watch more of her work on Vimeo. Links below. Hello everyone, it's Amanda. As many of you know, Antinatalism International is so proud to host the inaugural year of the Antinatalist Film Festival, a historic, first-of-its-kind event featuring the cinematic talents of the antinatalist community and anyone else who wishes to participate. This is officially the first big initiative of Antinatalism International and is honestly something that I've wanted to see happen for years now. The festival itself will be held the entire month of October 2021. And for this first year of the festival will be entirely an online screening event on the Antinatalism International website. In future years, however, we hope to be able to expand this event in several ways, not least of which is to make it a full, live, in-person event. So, are you thinking of submitting a video or film to the festival? Remember that the first early bird deadline to submit your film or video to the film festival on Film Freeway is March 31st. Please visit our links below to see the Film Freeway page with more info. Submission to the Film Festival is free. So thank you for listening, everyone. Can't wait to see what you all submit to the festival. Thank you so much, all the best, and bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. This has been Amanda Oldfans Sukunik and Mark J. Maharaj. You can find us on the YouTube channels Forever Wolf Films and Question Mark, respectively. Keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and email us at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast can be listened to on the YouTube channel Exploring Antinatalism Podcast, as well as Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Our website, www.exploringantinatalism.com, was designed by the amazing Visions Noirs. Please visit Visions Noirs at www.bilenoir.com and find links to more of his work below. Logo art by the incredible Life Sucks. Please visit his YouTube channel. And if you would perhaps like to purchase one of the new Exploring Antinatalism t-shirts by Life Sucks, please visit his Etsy page, www.etsy.com slash shop slash Life Sucks Publishing. And proudly announcing, our new theme music has been graciously provided by I Doubt It. I Doubt It is an alum of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, so please listen to his episode, episode 4, and visit his amazing YouTube channel. All the best, and bye for now.